Okay, so welcome to the Society for Ecological Restoration Northwest Chapter, Missoula Pub Talk. Tonight we have Paul Parson with Trout Unlimited here in Missoula to talk with us. And he's going to be talking about his restoration work in the middle Clark Fork River. So Paul is a civil engineer that specializes in stream and floodplain restoration. And he is Trout Unlimited's Clark Fork River Program Coordinator. <laughs> And I worked with Paul and a number of others from Trout Unlimited, including Tess. Christine's here. Christine's here. Hi, sorry. And without a doubt, these guys are spearheading a lot of stream restoration work in our neck of the woods. So thank you to Trout Unlimited. And thank you, Paul, for being willing to come and talk with us tonight. Turning it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Amy. Um, Thanks everybody. Thanks to uh, Imagination for having us and um, thanks to me for inviting me to do this. So my name is Paul Parson and I do run a restoration program for this section of the Clark Fork. And Trout Unlimited has a lot of project managers like myself spread throughout the country and we're lucky enough that in Missoula we have basically five of us based out of here that leave and spread out all over, including Christine, who's right there. Christine runs all over this part of Montana doing projects for us. Um, and Tess also is running our, our uh, program in Rock Creek. So a lot of good work happening all over. But tonight I want to focus on the Middle Clark Fork, which is basically, we can, we can put the boundaries on it from where the Blackfoot comes into the Clark Fork all the way down to where it hits the flathead. You can picture that if you go down past the St. Regis and down to where it runs in down by past Perm or that area. Um, so that's the middle Clark Fork and that's really where a lot of my work is focused. Um, good or bad, a lot of my work is focused on mine reclamation. Uh, and we'll go over this, a couple different kinds of mine reclamation as we work through this. Um, so, we've had quite a bit of history of working in the Nine Mile, and before we get into actual specific projects, I want everyone to know, and a lot of people in here probably have a lot of experience with, with mining and understanding it, but um, just to clarify, there are several different kinds of mining, and how um, valuable metals were mined depicts how we actually clean it up. The damages are, are significantly different. So the first thing that I want to talk about is hard rock mining. And that is where we have uh, ore that's contained in a, a body of rocks. It's usually quartz. Um, so it'll be gold, it'll be a vein. And so they, they actually tunnel in, is what you think of typically tunneling in and crushing up rocks. And that's usually um, a lot more, has a lot more contamination because you're dealing with chemical components to, to grind up this ore and treat it. And that's what we see here. These are mine tailings. You notice how everything is really green and lush all around here. Nothing will grow in this because this is mine tailings. This is Kennedy Creek in the Nine Mile drainage. Um, there were several mines in this little stream um, that occurred around the 1940s. But this is real typical of what you see at a hard rock mine site. So there are thousands of these throughout the West. Uh, these abandoned mines, these hard rock mines that look like this where nothing's growing. This is rock that's been crushed up. It's been tunneled in, pulled out of the side of the mountain, crushed up, and usually arsenic is kind of the, the chemical of choice to precipitate out the metals. That's why nothing will grow on this. You also notice that our stream, this is a small valley system. You see some cedars here and there's some spruce and some alder, but the stream's been pushed to the side of the valley because it essentially dumped all these mine tailings in the middle of the valley that pushes the stream over. So I just, I'm gonna give a couple of project examples of just how we look at these sites, assess them, and then work through the restoration process. And I also wanna talk about, there's a difference between restoration and reclamation. So a lot of times when we're dealing with a mine like this, we've gotta reclaim the site. We, we basically have to remove the pollutants and the, the physical properties that are, are um, 
I guess, contaminating the site before we can start the restoration process. So a lot of times we start with the reclamation project before we start the restoration process. So this is, this is a time-lapse camera that I had set up on this project. These are the mine tailings. You can see everything's green all around everywhere. The stream, most likely, prior to this happening, this, this was mined in the 40s to the 60s, probably came right down through here, right towards the camera. Um, like I said, they pulled uh, the ore out of the side of the mountain, ground it up, uh, maybe applied some arsenic or mercury to it to precipitate out the gold, and then piled it up here. And the stream is shoved over here on the side of the valley. So I'm just going to run through a series of photos on, on how we take care of these hard rock mines. Essentially what you need to do is remove these mine tailings. So how do you do that? You just dig it out. <laughs> you, get, you get rid of this stuff and then we call it, um, you find a spot that's high and dry. You dig a giant hole in the earth and you bury this stuff. And so um, unfortunately that's the best solution we have. So you find a south facing slope that's uh, free of groundwater, free of faults. You don't want seismic activity shaking this stuff up. Um, and the reason we look for south facing slopes is you don't want trees because once this stuff is buried, you want to cap it and grow grass on it. You don't want trees growing on it because what happens when trees tip over? We're, I mean, we're talking about this stuff's going to hopefully be stored for infinity. So we don't want a forest growing on it. We want a nice south facing slope that otherwise won't tip over and eventually expose this stuff back to the environment. So we, we find a, a place, we dig a big pit, we basically excavate this stuff out, haul it to the big pit and bury it. That's kind of what the process looks like. It's not rocket science, really. You just keep going and going and going until, and you're testing, you're sampling the soil the whole way to make sure that you're getting all the contaminants out. And once you start getting organic material, Unfortunately, a lot of times that organic material absorbs metals and you go further and further until you don't find any metals. So once we have all this mine waste removed, um, we still have this restoration component. The reclamation is essentially done. What we're doing here is we're bringing in this layer of material here. That was all brought in. That's the material from the repository. You think of this big hole that's dug in the ground. And this repository is about five miles away from this site. There's all that material that's there. We can use that. It's good, clean material. We bring that back and we can start rebuilding this floodplain in this area. But what do we do with the stream? We know that it's been shoved to the side. It's way over there. And it probably should be right, right down the middle of this valley. And so, this is real typical, and Dave Pontreau is here tonight. Um, this is a picture of me, but this could very well be a picture of Dave. Um, that's the look we usually have <laughs> after our reclamation work is done, and we're thinking, how do we create this stream from scratch? You know, we've got a point A that's up in the woods that's where it's intact. You have an intact stream and an intact ecosystem. And you have a point B that's downstream, and you have an impact ecosystem, and everything's intact. But we have this huge middle part that's completely destroyed. So this is us scratching our heads. And um, it's, once again, it's not rocket science. It's, you're dealing with energy grades. You know your point A, your point B. We study analog drainages. Fortunately for Cedar Creek, or for Kennedy Creek, we look at this, see all those nice cedars there? So right upstream where the mining didn't occur is this beautifully intact stream. So it made this job really easy because we could just, we measured that stream and came up with our dimensions and our slopes and, and our step pool spacing that we wanted. So our template for constructing a new stream from scratch was there. We just measured that, took those dimensions, applied it here, and that's what we're doing here. You see a, we have a survey rod. That log is, is uh, building a new step pool. Um, that's what we found in our, in our analog stream system upstream was all these cedar trees falling in and built these step pool systems. And so we, we essentially try to just mimic as much as we can the natural environment. And, 
Um, so it's not rocket science, but it does take a little bit of, you have to carefully measure and, and um, kind of go in the eyes wide open. So this is us figuring out how to build a stream. You can see the start of our new stream bank there. Those rocks there, that's going to form the, the edge of our stream bank. This is going to form the start of a, a pool as it plunges over. And this is our contractor working his way out, looking downstream from where, where those photos were taken. So those photos were taken from here looking up. This is a photo looking down. So this is all our newly created. So there was mine tailings all through this valley, about 10 feet deep. So those are all removed. We started our new stream construction. We're getting forced out by snow because that's how we do it. Um, so that's July 2015. That was the next spring. So recovery is pretty quick. If you can provide the proper dimensions, um, the proper floodplain, revegetation, these systems can bounce back. It's they're pretty resilient. I mean, you go from you know the mine waste was ten feet high here a year before this, or nine months before this, and all of a sudden we have an intact step pool system with you know we planted a lot of cedar and spruce. Um, I need to update this too because now the grasses are higher and the yellows are bigger. Um, so that's an example of a hard rock mine where you had contaminated mine tailings. The other type of work, um, the other kind of mining that we restore is placer mining. Significantly different than hard rock mining. Placer mining entails gold that's sitting freeform. It's been scoured out by glaciation erosion out of the rocks, falls to the valley bottom, and you find this gold in the stream bottom. So if you think of panning for gold, things of that nature, that's what this is. Unfortunately, this is on a lot larger scale. So this is the Nine Mile Valley. This is a LiDAR image of Nine Mile Creek. Anyone tell me where Nine Mile Creek is in this image? <laughs> well, it's in the Nine Mile, yeah. But, I mean, this is, this is real typical of what we see with, with uh, damage there. So, this plaster mine, uh, the process for plaster mining is essentially the gold is already sitting free form. They don't need to crush up rock or apply chemicals or anything. It's just gold sitting in the system. They just have to dig it, sift it out, and separate it from the sand and rock. A lot of this damage is, um, occurred in the 40s. It started in the 1870s by hand and went through the 40s and then all the way up through the 70s. And essentially what happened here is Nine Mile Valley is really rich in ore all around in the mountains, and as it glaciated 10,000 years ago, it scoured out those veins of gold. The gold eroded down the mountains, fell into a glacial lake. That glacial lake then, all that, that gold sifted down and sat on the bottom. So we had a glacial lake bottom. That glacial lake bottom underneath us right now is about 30 feet deep, I think. In the Nine Mile, it's also about 30 feet. So what did they do? They went after all that gold 30 feet deep. So we have these dark spots here are essentially giant, they're, they're dredge lines and they're about 30 feet deep because that's where they were going to get that gold. Subsequently, these ridges that you see, those are the piles that they dug out and put next. They had to move all the water they did have to move all the water. That's exactly right. Because they, they couldn't work in a stream. So what did they do? They moved the river to the side of the valley to get out of the way. So this is a um, this is a design drawing that we have that essentially shows a current condition and then our proposed condition. So this blue is an area that's too low. So if you picture a stream system that's been cut 30 feet down. It's confined, it's straightened, there's no floodplain, it's just like a fire hose, right? So that's this condition here. The red shows piles that are higher than the condition we want. Essentially, we want an elevation that's green. We want an elevation that's at the proper, proper elevation for ecological function. 
We want a floodplain that'll flood. We want a, a river system that's sinuous, that will absorb energy and provide habitat, slow water down. You look at this, that's not gonna slow anything down. That's the bowling alley effect, right? We essentially have a fire hose for seven miles. This, this damage occurred over about seven miles of land. So this is real typical of what we see out there. Um, this is our friend Eric from the DEQ, helping us assess erosion rates. Um, so we measure these piles and during spring runoff, the water's up here. You see any vegetation or any hardening that can keep that from eroding downstream. So picture seven miles of this, how much sediment is going into the Clark Fork, into the other parts of the Nine Mile that are affecting landowners downstream. No vegetation, this is real typical. So Nine Mile Creek, historically was probably at this elevation, somewhere in here, but now it's down here. What does that do to groundwater? Drops everything down. It turns, turns these sites into giant weed sites because there's the groundwater's down, no floodplain, everything's confined. So essentially, how do we solve this problem? And this is my favorite part. Uh, <laughs> you know, there, I hear a lot of times like, well, passive restoration will work. I, I think passive restoration works in a lot of places, but um, I really like this work because this is what works. So you get huge equipment to move these piles. You just, it's never gonna recover on its own. It's too confined. The, the elevation of the, the stream is too low. So what you have to do is remove these, these plaster mine piles. And, and mind you, this isn't contaminated work. They just were digging and sifting this gold out. There weren't chemicals applied. There's not crushed ore, none of that. So this is basically rocks and dirt. So what we can do is move these piles and basically fill those holes where they created. All the material that we need is there. We just regrade this whole valley. It's essentially what it is, is a valley restoration. It's not a stream restoration project. So this is the basically knocking these these big piles down, and um, we essentially figure out a width that we need for our floodplain. So you can see, there's two excavators, there's a pickup truck, um, rebuilding that that little valley, and then starting to build a new stream, the sinuosity. The stream used to be over here, running through here, really straight. Um, we also like to play around a little bit. So it's not just trap habitat we're concerned with. We're also um, basically concerned with riparian areas and, and full stream corridors. These aren't just fish projects. So we started with this concept of, you know, we're leveling these valleys pretty much to rebuild a, a small valley and rebuild a stream, but we're also, we're starting to, to put snags back up for uh, nesting birds and other functions try to jumpstart this process of healing. This is pretty fun actually to tell <laughs> to tell a, a contractor that's uh, I, they're pretty you know some rough type people and you tell them that you want to pay them to stand a tree up. They're used to knocking trees over for a living. Uh, it's, it's pretty entertaining but We've got everyone. Yeah, now we've got a system. There's chains and two excavators, and uh, we found out this was a little more dangerous than we thought. <laughs> Trial and error. We're really good at tipping trees over. We're starting to get a little bit better at putting them back up. Um, so once we have our basic stream bank built, you know, you notice a lot of willow cuttings, a lot of wood brush. We use. Um, a lot of wood from slash piles and logging units. Um, how many willows did we put on our last one? 10,000? 8,000 cuttings over about 3,000 feet. Um, pretty, there's a lot, of, a lot of vegetation that goes back in these. So these are all willow cuttings. We do this in the fall. Uh, so that's, that's what they look like when we put them in. Susie and Mud Pit. This is what it looks like the first spring. Nothing sprouted. It's pretty, boy, uh, we've, we've put in, you know, maybe a thousand plants in this area, you know, the prior year in the fall, but nothing's starting to sprout. But we're seeing runoff. 
So this is our newly constructed channel, our newly constructed floodplain. So all through here were those mine piles, 30 feet high, and big pits. There was a huge pit right here. That all got bulldozed. We shaped a new floodplain. We've got our meanders. We've got wood that we harvested. We've got willow cuttings all in here. We've got a lonely volunteer <laughs> planting plants in May. But one thing I want you to notice is, look how wet it is. Look at this saturation. You can see that it flooded, it absorbed that energy. There's no plants even. And it still was able to absorb that energy and not erode. Highly different than what it looked like nine months previous. So this is just an overview of what these projects do. So here's, it's hard to see, but I'll point it up. So here's Nine Mile Creek. So you see that straight line? That's what, what we showed earlier. Okay, and then you see, here's one of those pits. It's hard to see because Nine Mile is really wet, so there's a lot of vegetation, so it's, people don't think it's that jacked up, but it's pretty bad. Um, a lot of the shrubs cover up a lot of the, the function of the system. So you have this, this highly entrenched um, downcut stream system here that's totally bound by mine piles. Just really straight. We have some dredge ponds there. And then this, this through here, this area is about a 20 foot high mine pile. It's hard to see from this area, but that's a, that's a big mine pile that runs down this way. And I just want you to look at this. Keep your eye on this area here, okay? This little dredge pond complex. So essentially, you know, regrade everything, move the stream back into the middle of the valley. It doesn't need to be over on the side like a bowling alley. Um, those dredge ponds then become a wetland complex. And Amy's been really, I'd say, driving this construction process to the point where we're having oh, a they, yeah, You're gonna the contractors hate Amy because she flags everything and says, do not touch this. This is, has high ecological value. And we actually, um, we've changed our design significantly based on Amy's guidance with her knowledge of wetlands and plants and knowing this is an amazing intact wetland or, or she sees something she wants. So we'll regrade everything to make sure that we can save those plants. and. Um, at first, I mean, being a civil engineer, I just want to bulldoze everything. <laughs> but now I follow Amy. Yeah, now I follow Amy around. Like, okay, what else are we going to save now? Um, so now we have this system. You know, you see a pool riffle system. You can see these riffles are a little bit, a little bit shaded, and then the pools are on these outside bends. And that's a close up of that system. So here's our, our former channel in the straight, and we turned that into a wetland complex. It's amazing how many frogs and salamanders are in this within the first year. All new. These are all new wetlands that were created out of those dredge ponds. And this is our new channel. And you can, this image really shows, like you can see these deep pools, you can see these ripples. It's essentially providing a, I mean, it's hard to tell that that was constructed two years prior. Uh, so looking at this project on the Kennedy Creek project, it seems to be there's still an aversion to designing braided channels. Right. Mm -hmm. Why? Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, well, Kennedy Creek, you never would have a braided channel. It's about an 8% slope. Even with cedar log falls like that, and that's yeah. typically what creates a braided channel. Yeah, ever. you're in a really confined system. If you look at the analog, it's just so steep that it's just going to continually take the fall line. This system most likely will become a braided beaver complex. That's probably what it was. That's what this valley was, you know, 200 years ago when the beaver were trapped out. It's incredibly difficult to convince funding partners that I want to build a braided, unstable channel. So we have to think about this successionally. We have to think single thread channels are very, well, not very stable, but they're, they're the most stable form that we have for streams. We have to have that until the vegetation comes. And then hopefully nature will take over. But that's a really good question because 
I think if we could ever get to the point where we're building these graded channels to begin with, um, I, I think that it could, it, it's a good idea. I think for people's comfort level, I mean, this was the first project of this scale that had happened in this <coughs> region. So we had a lot of funders that were kind of, I don't know, you know, this was a million dollar project. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, a lot of money going into this with people saying, I don't know, you guys are crazy. You're some hippies from Child Unlimited. <laughs> uh, so this was this was a stable, acceptable plan for us. Our overall goal was to turn it back into that. What was 200 years ago? And but, I'd add, Paul, that like I mean, as this project has progressed phase by phase, that it's getting messier and messier. And Amy can take a lot of credit for that. But like mm -hmm. the side channels that are being oh, built yes. in are maintained, and the connectivity to the channel is definitely. Exactly. We're getting a lot more leeway, and um, I mean, the bottom line on a lot of this stuff is driven by funders. Mm -hmm. It's you're only going to go as far as people will let you go with their money. This isn't our money. This money is DEQ, DNRC, abandoned mines, FWP. They've never seen anything like this. This is the first mm -hmm. placer mine project of this scale. Anyway. Mm -hmm. So. And let's talk about this more at the end because there's a difference between a braided channel and a multi-thread and mass moving channel. Exactly. And definitely we are experimenting with how to have a primary thread channel with multiple channels that are activated, not just high flows, but moderate flows. And the last reef we just built, I think we kind of yeah. nailed it. So We're I don't know if you have pictures with that, but you're totally right. We need to progress that way. Yeah. And this was finished five years ago. So yeah, every phase we're integrating that more. But there, but there is a difference between braided and multi-thread, and this would have been a multi-thread system, very much controlled by users. Right? Exactly. That's, it's an awesome topic, so maybe let's talk about. Yeah, that. no, that's a really good point, and yeah, I, I think we're trending that way. Well, the more comfortable we get, because we've seen some. And the more people see it, like you said, funders and permit permitting agencies, the more they see. Those integrated features and see that they're not going to destabilize, they're actually going to make it more stable and mm -hmm. more balanced. Mm -hmm. They're getting on board with the channel. Yeah. All right, so this was taken a year after restoration, after we moved the channel over here, built this. So just keep an eye on this. And we're going to talk about what's our overall goal long term. Because this, you know, we're one to two years in at this photo. Um, and I, at this point, I'm ecstatic. I'm thinking, wow, we're doing it. This is awesome. But I'm going to go back up. Okay. Keep your eye on this tree. This is a fir tree here. This is the top of Ripple. This is kind of a pool complex coming around this corner. These next photos are going to be taken from right here looking up. All right. So this was a photo taken in 2017. You notice the height of the willows. Remember those willow cuttings we were putting in? So what we've seen anecdotally is after about year three, so this is 2017, this was built in 2014, year three, the vegetation really starts to take hold. Those willows are about three to four feet high. Beaver have not been in this reach for over a hundred years, we think, since this mining damage occurred. There's an intact beaver complex in Buster. They've tried, they'll come down, they'll set up a beaver, you know, a structure, and then it blows out every spring because what do you have? You have that fire hose. Mm -hmm. So they cannot survive in this area. Also, there's not enough food for them. Willows can't survive in this area. But what have we provided? We provided more floodplain, a slower system, and all of a sudden, three years later, the willows are three to six feet high. Look what happened last fall. <laughs> we have new beaver dams on this. So, while we built a single thread channel, what is this going to lead to? This is our overall goal, right? To have this beaver complex with a, a complex, wet, valley-wide braided channel system. We didn't build it, but it's happening because we built the proper floodplain dimensions and we had proper stream dimensions. It relieved enough pressure. And we'll see, I mean, this was built in um, September of this last year. We'll see if it's still there. I think there's enough floodplain capacity with this control, but we'll see. And that's checked water up enough that it's overflowing into a swale, and yeah. then we constructed it and replayed back into the channel. Yeah. So it 
So essentially that beaver dam is like right here. So all of this area is completely saturated. And we have multi-thread channels coming from all three. So that's exactly, that was exactly what your point was. And initially we thought this might happen within 20 to 50 years. And it happened within four years. So that's just a quick overview. Um, we were really fortunate to have Christine Brissett um, conduct her graduate research on this section of Nine Mile Creek. And we can have Christine talk a little bit about, well, yeah, why don't you just give a quick speech? Put you on the spot. <laughs> um, yeah, so my, my graduate research is Chelsea Jensen, so here at Um Really just trying to look at the, the impact of these techniques that kind of re meandering stream on the historic. So can we talk a lot about the restoration to be kind of soak the sponge in the floodplains, and then that water will be available to support these flows. But there's not a lot of numbers actually supporting that. We don't know how much water comes back in, we don't know when that water comes back in. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that works, but actually quantified evidence is not there. And so as part of my graduate or perhaps of my graduate research was working on the time model by trying to quantify that using a bunch of different methods. Um, and what we saw was that, yes, in fact, restoration does promote storage. They did see that storage in the plains and southern wells. And then we also saw that water coming back into the stream that they slow to the tune of about an acre foot or acre foot per day, which is about a half a CPS, um, which is a pretty substantial amount of water in a region like this, you know, in, in late August. It's enough to be worthwhile. Um, so it's not, I mean, I always need to throw in a caveat that, like, you can't just say that that's what's going to happen to your system. It's going to depend a lot on the ge geology of your soil. But the fact that we are, it works and we able to work this way. Pretty, I mean, it, it's something that we always thought about, but we never had the numbers to the students for that. So I was really glad someone was able to, to study it and put numbers to it. Um, so we know floodplain storage is good. We know late season. Um, Char recharging of the aquifer is good. Um, the other thing this provides is, you know, you look at those big mine piles that are eroding every single spring, the last 100 years. Um, through our measurements, we calculate about 360 tons per year of sediment reduction. So we have to two miles. So, you know, 1,500 tons of sediment that were we produced so far um, annually. And then, you know, you talk about climate adaptation, native species. You know, if we're looking at a threshold where cutthroat and net trout are right on the brink of, of not surviving, you know, see non native species um, expanding habitat into new habitat. When we can add a half a CFS, we can, we can add these slower pool systems, these more natural systems. I think we're just, you know, move, actually moving the needle on this. And for the first time, we had fisheries biologists up here, and after we built this, we found um, some spawning reds of what the fisheries biologists thought were big cuts that would come out of the carpet. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that they were spawning in the straight to stream because there was no gravel. When you slow it down, the gravels show up. And so now we're starting to see spawning of these big fluvial fish coming up. They've always been coming up, but it's like, what are they doing? They're coming up. They were trained to come up, you know, it's ingrained in them. What genetics are telling them. There's nowhere to spawn. So now we have a whole new age class in the fish that are rearing in the sun. So um, we actually haven't done a post uh, fishery survey because the biologists are like, it's so complex and natural that it's really, really hard to count fish now. It's so woody and the pools are so deep. We can't count the fish. So we're trying to develop some methods to get accurate fish counts on this. Um, but anecdotally, we think the fish fishery population has gone way up. Um, so that's kind of the mining reclamation work that we're working on in this basin. And I want to just touch real quickly on things that some of the habitat work that we're doing that isn't related to mining. A lot of it's um, due to past forest practices. And one of the easiest low lying fruit that we can take care of are forest road systems that were built right on top of the stream. They basically push the streams, you know, tighten the stream, straighten them out. Um, you look at this project area, you look at how straight that is. 
Um, that's about a three mile reach. And so I'll just go over something that's not mining related, it's road related. And what, what we worked with the Forest Service to develop a plan and, and uh, develop. So Cedar Creek is right outside of Superior. It's about an hour west of here if you drive on I-90. And this road system, prior to having a road, they built a railroad up this, this drainage. So railroads don't turn, they go straight. So they basically pounded a railroad straight up this valley and then when the railroad proved to be um, an economic hindrance to the logging operations, they built a road on top of the railroad. So we have, a, I mean, if you want to drive 100 miles an hour on a dirt road, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> so fast on this road because it's straight and flat in a really steep canyon, so it's actually pretty fun. But not so good for a stream system, right? Like we have Cedar Creek coming down here. This is a bull truck cutthroat stream. Um, we're about five miles up from the confluence of the Clark Fork. See all this riparian habitat over here? Completely disconnected. So what's the plan? We'll take this road out, we'll move it up on the side of the mountain, rebuild that floodplain similar to what we do in Nine Mile Creek. And we're not gonna do anything with the stream other than when we build these new roads, we're knocking down giant cedar trees and giant spruce trees. So we can take all that wood and put it back in the stream where it should be. There isn't wood in these systems because the stream is no stream because of the road. It's like this circular logic, right? Kind of fries my brain sometimes. But <laughs> when you have these straight systems and a tree falls in, where does it go? It's going to blow out like a fire hose. All of a sudden, we take this road, we move it over here, we have floodplain, that energy is dissipated, it's able to spread out. Extra bonus, we're building a new road on the side of the mountain, we have all these trees, we can put those in the stream and build modules. That's what our analog, so we, you know, we talk about analog and what we want to study and how we want to build things. We luckily have a drainage that's right next to this, it's intact, the road system is far away, we can measure distance for every log jam, how it occurs naturally, our full ripple systems. Take those trees, build big log jams. It's probably the most fun stuff we can do. So this is looking, that's where the road came. That's that photo you saw before, the screen's right there. All of a sudden we take the road out, we lower it, lower it down to where we think the flood plane was. We're not exactly sure that you did until you find what you think was the original elevation. Then we make it really messy and plant a bunch of plants. Um, so that's what it looked like in the fall when we finished. You see how we put the road over there and we built a series of log jams. We built, for this project, we built 113 log jams over three miles. And a lot of them were, you know, about half the size of this room, you know, six to 10 feet high and, and full spanning across the stream. What that'll do is it'll slow the stream down. It'll provide sorting so we get spawning gravels. Because a lot of times when these, when these straight and stream systems, there's no gravel. There's no habitat. It's just, the velocities are too fast. It takes all the gravel down to the park. So that's what it looked like the first spring runoff. So you can see that old road profile. That's all floodplain now. So that's dissipating energy. We're getting gravel and sand and organics and seed sources all dropping out. But you see how we placed all this wood? That's absorbing all that energy. Before, I mean, look how look how skinny that stream is. That's what it was for seven, you know, seven, eight months. And all of a sudden you, you provide this capacity, the stream drops its energy out, drops all that organics, and that's what you end up with. And I'm always a little bit puckered the first runoff after you do these projects because you're worried that you're gonna, you did something wrong and you're gonna lose it. And that's what it looked like right after, um, you know, probably in June or July. Look at the grasses, that, that floodplain. That's where the road was the year before. And then, lo and behold, what happens when you provide floodplain capacity, you put log jams in, uh, you know, you try, provide some resistance, we've got beavers moving in. So now they're going to take over the new road. It's like a recurring green here. We can just jumpstart these ecosystems, the natural processes, and they'll just kind of take over from themselves. You have to provide the proper dimensions and form them. So here's a new Beaver Lodge. So this is one we completed two years ago, year and a half ago, and then we came back the next year and 
one below me at Aviva Lodge. That's a fisheries biologist for the Lolo National Forest because we were finding spawning reds behind these lodges where the graphics previously the spawning reds didn't, didn't exist in this whole reef since so like five miles. Um, also on Cedar Creek, I want to say the fishery studies are showing that we're seeing a sevenfold increase in fish populations through this reef. So it's worth it. Um, so in summary, um, those are kind of the work that we're doing in this great <coughs> We've got another project in Cedar Creek we're going to do this year. Uh, we've, we're going to take out some roads and fish <coughs> for sediment reduction. We have another phase in Nine Mile Creek, about um, 4,000 feet in Nine Mile Creek we're going to do. And then we're working on a super fun site in Superior to remove some of the Taylor's hard rock um, And then this is a photo of, anybody know? Rattlesnake Dam. Um, my colleague Rob Roberts is currently driving, he's the driving force to, it's like his personal mission to get this thing up. Um, it's you know, right up to Rattlesnake below the trail right there. And I think we're doing pretty well on fundraising. The planning is coming along. So that's, you know, if everything goes according to plan, like it's moving, you know, that dam will be coming out probably in 2020. So that's pretty cool. So that's essentially what we have going in the middle Clark Fork right now. That's all I have. <laughs>